is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Deadwood, Season 3, Episode 10, A Constant Throb. In this episode, I thought that I had a dirty mind for thinking that that sounded like a certain thing, and then it turns out I don't have a dirty mind at all. That's exactly what they meant in the episode. Also, I am just so ready for somebody to pop Hearst in the fucking head. And if this season ends without Hearst dead, and it turns out that he's going to be the feature in the movie, I really hope the movie ends with him dead. Either way, please let this man die. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So, um, this is a delayed recording. I was supposed to record this on Friday and wound up having to push it back till today, which is Monday. Um, I got really sick over the weekend. So I ask your forgiveness for the sound of my voice for if I have to take any breaks, uh, to take a sip of juice. I've got some OJ sitting here to clear things up. Um, my voice is back, thank God, but I just, you know, I'm not quite a hundred percent but, uh, and also I'm finding that I run out of breath a lot quicker <laughs> for some reason when I'm talking. Um, so thank you to Patrick for commissioning this and thank you to Patrick also for his patience and letting me reschedule this. Um, so this episode, I watched this last night and I realized as I was watching this, there is a scene in this with Jerry the uh, the dude who is Com- Commissioner Jerry, is that his name, his, his title? Um, that I forgot to talk about from the last episode that I can't believe I forgot to talk about. It's just because I ran out of time, I'm pretty sure. When he's talking to Hearst and he says that he's like a baby bird just waiting for nourishment from his mouth and then he does the little like that weird beak, like baby bird face, I almost, like my skin almost crawled right off my body. I can't believe that I forgot to mention that because in this episode, he is similarly over obsequious and creepy and pathetic, but not coming quite as close as, as to anything as he was like that that moment, I thought he was actually fucking with Hearst because it's so over the top creepy and unnecessary and weird that for a second I was like, oh shit, is Jerry like being like defiant and fucking with Hearst like to his face? And Hearst gets a look on his face like he doesn't know what to make of this either. So I wouldn't have been surprised if Hearst kind of thought the same thing. And then it turns out that it's just Hearst being like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Because Jerry was being 100% serious, like trying to be like clever and amusing with, with Hearst in that manner. Way to misjudge the guy. Like I can't think of a worse person to take that sort of tone with. It's just so awkward and awful. I am, I'm one of those people who can't deal with like cringe humor. It's part of why I, I like the show, the office in general, but there are a lot of portions of that show that I can't deal with, especially early seasons where it really relied heavily on cringe humor And then there are movies like Meet the Fockers and stuff like that. Like, I couldn't. I watched like 10 minutes of one of those and I just can't deal with it. And to know that like Jerry is that bad at calculating who he's talking to 
really like I didn't think much of the guy to begin with, but that really like takes it to a new level of like, wow, dude, you have you are way out of your depth here. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that out of the gate because I 100 percent intended to talk about that and then completely lost track. Um, so I'm going to mention something that I found out here because I was talking about this show to a friend. And he didn't spoil me on anything. But this episode begins with a scene between Doc Cochran and Cy. And Cy has this really bad injury that he keeps picking at from when he got stabbed. And the Doc is basically like, you are the worst combination of self-pitying and stupid. And you need to fucking knock it off with messing with this because it's not going to heal And if you keep messing with it, I'm not coming back and I'm not going to fix you again. Well, I'm watching this. I'm just like, this is literally in this episode, almost the only time we see Sai, I think. I think there's another like maybe short moment because of Janine. But Sai has been so sidelined and is basically completely impotent this season. And a friend of mine mentioned that the actor who plays Cy, what's his name? Powers Booth. What a fucking name, man. Um, Powers Booth. He was apparently promised, like, I don't know if it was in a contract or if it was a verbal agreement that he would be in the show from beginning to end. And they just didn't really know what to do with him. So they did this, which is nothing. And I feel bad for this actor because it's really clear that, like, they don't know what to do with him. And Sai is just basically reduced to making fun of and tormenting anyone who comes near him because he is so powerless that he has to take it out on the people around him who can't stand up for themselves. And it's so pathetic and really like, it's just a bummer. And I, I guess my friend telling me that did kind of spoil me because it means that I know Sai is going to make it to the end of this series. But being as though there's only like two episodes left, I pretty much assumed that by now anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just like really wondering what writer makes that kind of promise to an actor? I feel like that's a bad plan. And it shows that they don't know where where to go with him. You know, his scenes are just so agonizingly, as the doc puts it, full of self-pitying. Like, it's it's a combo of self-pity and, and this, like, naked self-interest that doesn't even have the intelligence to hide itself anymore the way they used to. He doesn't even really make an effort to do his job well. Um, I guess because he feels like who else is going to do it now? And like, nobody's going to unseat him for his spot in Bella Union. Nobody wants this place except for maybe Joni. If he died, she could take a spot, which would be pretty rad. Um, but yeah, I don't see that happening. But anyway, yeah. So this whole thing with, uh, Psy is really like dragging. And now that I know that's what was going on, it makes a little more sense because I keep waiting for them to do something with him and they're not, and I couldn't figure it out. And it seems like they just didn't really have a plan. So there it is. Um, and briefly Patrick's here in the chat. Hi, Patrick. Uh, Patrick sent me an email and I'm going to read this to you guys real quick. Um, or maybe I shouldn't Patrick. Do you think that this is going to be something that comes up in the movie? Do you think that I should like save this? I'm kind of wondering, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I have a feeling this isn't going to be something the movie focuses on. Um, okay. So he writes me an email Subject is, might find this interesting. Jack and Claudia, theater people. Remember I said I emailed the actor who played Dan back in the day. 
and he shared info on the theater people, but I was hazy on the details. I just found out he's been posting on the Deadwood subreddit over the last couple months, and someone asked about why Claudia slept with Khan, size guy. Here's what he said. Claudia was indeed trying to make Jack Langrish jealous. However, the relationship behind that attempt at rearing the green-eyed monster wasn't as simple as it may first appear. She was Jack's biological daughter. However, she was unaware of the fact. He had sired her years before, then went upon his merry way. Upon learning of the death of her mother, he returned and recruited the teenage Claudia to join his troop. He never told her of their true relationship. She felt an immense attraction to Jack while not understanding its origin. She mistook it for a sexual thing. Her attempts at seducing Jack failed, so she wanted to make him jealous by sleeping with others. In her edible quest, she searches out father figures, which led her to the unctuous toad, Con Stapleton. All of this would have played out in season four if there had been a season four. Unctuous toad is really something. Um, so yeah, that's explaining a lot, because that's all I could get from that scene was that she was trying to make him jealous, but it's so clear from the way that Jack looks at her that for him, there's no attraction like that at all. Like, it's just not... It's just so clear he doesn't see her that way. And her frustration in this episode as well, um, you know, it's... There's just a real feel to this episode that they are trying to set things up with the theater crowd that never are going to come to pass. And it's kind of a shame because it's interesting. Like I, I'm curious what a lot of this backstory is that they wind up setting up, but you'll forgive me if I don't wind up getting too much into it in my recaps here, talking about it, because I know that that's probably not going to lead to very much. Um, so I'm going to, Move on to, oh yeah, well, I'll talk about what's going on with Jack, like out of the gate anyway, because Jack goes to visit uh, this woman, Josiane, and Josiane is like, is she also his daughter? Because the vibe that she has is that she wants, he says, he's talking to her like in her rooms about coming to join the theater troupe and that he has paid for her rooms to stay here. And she tells him that she won't take any money from him. And he is getting angry at her for not accepting his, his help, but also putting him on the spot. She feels like she wants to like, humiliate him, but then not accept what it seems she's begging for in the first place. Um, and she says that she's here to learn and he's like, well, okay, sure. But you need somewhere to stay. And she asks to stay in the theater. And he looks like he's going to deny her in this scene, but then it turns out that he's going to go ahead and cave and he tells everybody else later that she is indeed going to stay in the theater. And I don't really understand the setup. So there's a vibe that makes it feel like either she is a child of his that he abandoned, similar to Claudia, or that he is somebody that he like knocked up and abandoned or otherwise mistreated. It's somebody that he fucked over is, is the long and short of it. But she is a woman of just such an age that it's hard to tell which she is. Claudia, for example, I would have pegged as being a little too old to be his daughter. But, you know, like the ages in this show are kind of all over the place for me in terms of what I'm supposed to think versus what they look like. So, OK, let's go back to um, Jerry and talking to uh, Hurst. Hearst is talking to Jerry 
well, kind of. Hearst is listening to Jerry talk to him while he focuses on Alma outside in the thoroughfare. There's a brief moment where Aunt Lou comes up. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Hold on, let me take a sip because my voice keeps like crapping out on the last syllable. Okay. He is watching Alma coming up the thoroughfare. And Aunt Lou comes up to him at one point and he tells her that they're going to make arrangements for her son's remains. I was kind of surprised that more does not come of that this episode. It's understandable why it doesn't because things get sidelined by another thing he does. But I'm really dying to find out what happened to Odell. I'm not sure if we will, to be honest. If we don't, I'll be disappointed. But I won't be that surprised because I bet people died like this with no closure a lot. And especially a black woman, he's going to feel like he does not owe her anything, you know. But anyway, so he's he's listening to Jerry who's talking about like the fact that he has taken so much of the camp under his own control, taking control of the hotel, yada, yada, yada. And it's obvious to Jerry that he's not paying attention to the conversation as he watches Alma really closely as she passes by. Now, this has nothing to do with anything, but I do feel the need to say something to, uh, to say something about Alma's amazing dress in this scene there first of all it looks like she's wearing ravenclaw colors and if i were going to make a ravenclaw dress it would be this this is one of the most beautiful things they've had her wear on the show and i am really glad that she has so many scenes in this episode so that i got to look at it a lot because it is gorgeous i loved it okay so She's walking along, heading to the bank, and they decide to do one of the most brazen things so far this season. They try to just fucking shoot Alma in the street. Now, it's arguable whether or not they're really, really trying to shoot her. It seems pretty clear that they're just trying to fuck everybody's shit up. Like they're trying to lure out and, and thank God Seth is out of town right now. I think they say he's in Sturgis. I don't remember why he's there. Um, but Seth, if he had been here at this time, this would have worked 100%. That's the only miscalculation that Hurst makes here is that he's like fucking, I don't know if he's unaware Seth isn't there or if he just underestimates how much Seth is the one you need to rely on to lose his temper or what. Patrick says he's campaigning. Oh, really? He's camp. I didn't think that he needed to campaign anywhere, but. Like, I thought Deadwood was it. I need a map or something. Patrick, do you have a map of, like, the, the area and, like, what was surrounding it and how the election would go? It's probably not really necessary at this point. But I'm I'm realizing that I assumed that it was just, like, the camp, Deadwood itself, that was going to be voting. But if he's campaigning over in Sturgis, I'm realizing that I don't know anything about how this vote is going to go. Like, I know that they have um, all these men that are, like, waiting on the sidelines that are going to be voting for Hearst's interests, but I assumed that they'd, like, come into town and pretend to be, like, you know, working on Hearst's claim or buying their own claims or something like that and pretend to be residents of Deadwood, and that was how they would handle it. So I guess they don't have to do that. Um... But anyway, okay, so Seth is not here, and thus the day is saved, because if he had been here, we see later how he reacts. This is not a man in control of himself. 
and as much as he has managed to put aside his feelings for Alma in favor of Martha, he clearly still cares about her, and it's just an insult to the town, period. Like, even if this weren't Alma, somebody that he had a history with personally, I like to think Seth would kind of probably reacted the same way. Um, maybe not as strongly, but like, I think it'd be pretty close. So she gets shot at and everybody starts yelling for her to get down. Somebody says to make herself small. It might be Charlie who says that. And then fucking Al jumps down from his balcony to go help her. Now guys, I would like to remind you all, as I'm watching these episodes, I'm also going back and watching the first season right now with Owen. And it is a really startling thing to go from the, the Al in season one, who is trying to get Alma high so that he can rip her off and fuck her over. And to now see him leaping off a balcony to save her when she's being shot at. Like, it is a real 180. And I love it. Like, if I told Owen that this happened, he would assume that this was all 100% because she had something Al wants. And that he's trying to protect her because it's in his interest. Now, don't get me wrong. It is him protecting her because it's in his interest because he has to, like keep hers from winning, basically, and keeping Alma alive and protecting her is winning. But he doesn't have to jump off his balcony to do, you know what I mean? Like, this is an Al who has started to care about people a little bit. Like, he really, he doesn't want to show it, and I understand why not, and I recommend he doesn't. <laughs> I honestly do. But, like, what a change, you know? And what a, it's a, a really, the the character growth that he has had. I'm really glad that I went back and that I've been watching the first season again. I feel like it just underlines a lot for me. So this scene is actually like really a pretty big deal. Like at the time I'm thinking it's a big deal because they're trying to shoot her. And then it becomes clear fairly quickly. That's not actually what it is, but it is that Hearst is basically putting his cards on the table here. Like he is, he comes and walks out and stares at them in a way that feels like he is letting them know this is my doing and I'm going to see how you react to it. And Al ushers her inside uh, with Charlie on the other side and just like assures her that everything is fine, that she's fine. Don't worry about it. And doesn't curse at him or like say, what the fuck are you doing, you cocksucker? Which certainly would have been justifiable. Um, and you can see that Hurst is a little bit surprised at the reaction that he's getting here. And that is nothing as compared to what he's like later. Because he keeps waiting for them to do something. And they just don't do it. And that is the hardest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Like, I don't know how many of you all have been in this position where you're being needled by somebody and you know that you like your best option is to simply not participate. But that is probably the hardest thing to ask of me of anything. I am a, I won't say that I'm a confrontational person, but I will say that I like to, to address things at least. And if you make it so that I can't even do that, if I have to pretend everything is fine. And the fact that Al is willing to sit on his hands is again a piece of his character development, because I don't think season one now would have been capable of this. He would not have stopped long enough to think about the long-term 
And even if he had, I don't think he could control himself after the number of things that Hearst has done. I mean, quite apart from Alma being shot at, Al got a finger chopped off. So like, yeah, I think that's going to be the thing that catapults him right over the edge. You know, like, um, I feel like season one, Al would rather have gone, gone down in a blaze of glory than sat by and not done anything because he would have thought that the first option was somehow more honorable or like made him more of a man. And, uh, you know, not always true. Um, Devin's here says, I've not caught up on the show. So my volume is down just here to say, I'm so happy you're up and about Natasha. Thank you, Devin. Yeah. My voice is starting to go. I have another commission after this one. And uh, I'm thinking that I might push it back so I have a little more time to recover. But we'll see. Oh, and Patrick shared a map here. Oh, cool. You can zoom on it and everything. New Chicago, Deadwood City. Oh, wow. This is cool. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'll try and remember when I post this episode to post the link to this in the show notes. But don't yell at me if I forget. Um, it's pretty funny how it's labeled though. Cause it says things like hills covered with dead timber. Like there's a lot of really descriptive, uh, d uh, like they're not areas that are named. So they're just talking about what's there. Um, extensive deposits of gold bearing quartz formations of blue slate. Huh? That's cool. Thank you, Patrick. Um, all right, so they bring her inside. Al tells Charlie to send a telegraph to get um, Seth back as soon as possible. And he makes sure that Charlie leaves out the back. Um, upstairs and fucking around, you'll find the fucking telegraph. I forgot about that, that they're connected in the back. So yeah, he can go in and out and Hearst won't be able to see, which is a really nice bit of... Uh, I, it's weird to me how many of these like buildings are connected this way. It's not that I don't buy it because it's something that I know to be true. Like I've, I've read about this and also we have like earlier Saul is attached to wherever it is that, uh, Trixie's staying, but it is kind of, um, a strange thing that they would choose to like create doorways between them. But anyway, uh, the whole thing is there's like a, uh, a sense of everybody waiting on Al to respond and nobody seems to be quite sure what to expect from him in that regard, because he's obviously been handling things in a very different way than they're used to, which makes sense because this is a very different foe than they're used to. Al is not usually up against somebody who has the same amount of power as him. Never mind somebody who has more. So <clears throat> poor Alma is really shook up. And uh, she is, she's like, she says something about how she needs to take off her corset because she's kind of hyperventilating a little bit. And yeah, I would imagine that that would like, mess things up for her. Um, so they start talking about what's going on and the fact that she was the target and what that means, who it probably was. And she isn't a fool and has a pretty good idea of who it was. And Al finally is like, I think what we need to do is to send you on. I think that they're the best way to prove to them that we are in control of the situation and not going to fold under his uh, bullying, essentially, is to not only have you continue your journey and get where you're going, but to do it alone. We're going to make sure to send you out without an escort, which is 100% what 
what he's going to expect us to do. He wants an escort because he wants to draw us out because he wants to force us into a conflict on quote your behalf. Like basically what I think Al suspects would happen here is that they would be what flanking her as she walks to the bank and then somebody shoots at her again or some other kind of attack. But I suspect shooting would be it again because they like to keep undercover, don't they? Because they're cowards. So shoots at her again and then they all start shooting in response and then they get held responsible for like possibly innocent people being hurt in the thoroughfare because they just went nuts. So that's my suspicion. Um, so meanwhile, Dan has gone and like tied up. I love this so much. He has gone and tied up, uh, Ellsworth and honked him over the head, apparently, in order to tell him what's going on so that he can make sure Ellsworth doesn't do exactly what the fuck he wants to do, which is jump up and run to Alma's defense. And Ellsworth is such a precious little cinnamon roll. I love him so much, you guys. I just do. He cares about her so much. Even if it's not romantic, it may be. I just think he's really careful about showing it. And it may be. But Dan, it's kind of fun to see him in this situation. Because Dan tends to be the one that everyone else orders around. So for him to get put in this spot where he's ordering Ellsworth around is, it's kind of unusual to watch. And I found it a lot of like, it was fun, but also kind of like sad uh, because he is making Ellsworth do the same thing as Al, which is sit on his hands. Um, and what's, oh yeah, here it is. So <laughs> here it is that what Al says, um, do you want to close? No, I don't want to close. Fucking hers to see not one single sign on any fucking front that he's had half a cunt hair's effect on, on any of the comings and goings in this camp. Which, you know what? I just love this tactic. It's, it's, I know I've gone over this already, but I would like to say it again, that it's kind of genius. And now you've come a long way. So Charlie comes in, says that he has sent the telegram and then says that he is going to go and, uh, take over watching like the kids apparently, because that's where Silas is and he's going to send Silas back. He also says something where just, where, what is it? Oh yeah. Blazanov's helping Merrick dress. And Al says, why the fuck would you say that to me? And he says, Merrick that was beat up yesterday is being helped to dress by Blazanov. Now Blazanov sent the telegram to the sheriff. So Merrick could come do his part. Um, so Merrick is going to be writing about this, I guess maybe. Um, but yeah, I really like this whole situation. Like with Charlie getting involved, like, Really what it, what it is about this season that I enjoy, especially in contrast to what I'm watching right now in season one, is the entire town coming together against Hearst. Charlie, Seth, Saul, Merrick, the way that they interacted with Al in the first season, I mean, there's no comparison. It's just... The, the outright suspicion and violence and way that they would like try and screw each other over or hint that they were trying to screw each other over. Like, you know, it was certainly amusing and, and it was justified. I would also like to say, 
But there is something kind of moving about how everybody has agreed that Hearst needs to go. Like, it just emphasizes so much how alone Hearst is. And he says that he's alone in a way that makes it sound like he's so misunderstood and nobody else has the vision that he has. But the truth is that he's alone because he's a monster and a bad person and a child. I, Al at one point compares him to a three-year-old picking up his toys and going home because he can't win the game that he's playing. And that's 100% correct, which I would like to point out is very similar to a certain somebody that is in power today, by the way. But I find it to be as much as I don't want this to be the final season of the show. There's something very appropriate about the final season having this tone to it of the whole camp coming together as allies against somebody who does not have the best interests of the camp or the people in it at heart. And I think that's kind of touching. I'm really sorry about my voice, you guys. I really am. I'm trying. <laughs> um, so... Oh, and I want to mention again, too, I, I said something last episode about how Richardson, um, that I like the fact that they seem to be doing more with him. He gets a little bit less to do this episode, and I'm still, like, holding out, thinking that maybe there's something more that could go on. But I really enjoy him as a character. And side characters that come, come up more this episode as well, um, primarily Jewel who I miss, honestly, like I enjoyed her so much in season one that I keep seeing her on screen and hoping that she's going to have more of a part to play, but she's kind of been put back to the side again. Um, but I really like her in this episode because she's kind of a stand in. So what, it, and, and I want to address what this is really. We have a couple of scenes that I feel like show a, a surprising amount of sensitivity and foresight to what women's attitudes would have been toward Alma. And I don't feel like a lot of shows would have explored this at all. And it could seem kind of like out of nowhere to certain people and maybe superfluous or unnecessary. But I, as a woman, want to address it because we have more than one scene. We had a scene two episodes ago, I think, where all the men who were important in town get together to have a meeting, but they don't invite Alma, even though she runs the fucking bank and should be there. And then we have this, where the whores are all talking about how Alma didn't talk to them, but they're debating why and whether it's because she's just a snob, but they think that's probably not it because she talks to Trixie. So then they're like, well, maybe she just doesn't have anything to talk to us about. And again, it may seem strange, but Alma is a woman who has essentially done for herself. She came to town married. Her husband died. She had an affair with a guy that she actually gave a shit about. Married a decent dude who is willing to stand at arm's length and let her do whatever she wants and not rule over her at all. And then she opens a fucking bank because she is making so much money on her claim, which she did not cave and sell and run home with the money like everybody expected her to. It is really understandable why all of these oppressed women who have no options are fascinated by this woman and want to be friends with her and like understand her because of course a woman like Alma is so rare and a woman 
like Alma anywhere else, I don't feel like would have gotten the opportunities that she's gotten in Deadwood. Part of why she has succeeded is because this place hasn't got the rules and regulations that other places do. So there's this weird scene where Jewel brings Alma breakfast and is like obsessing over whether she's going to eat any of it and what she's eating and how much she ate and whether she liked it. And it's so adorable because it's like this like little bit of hero worship. She wants this awesome woman who's basically a legend to eat her breakfast. Of course she does. It's like if Beyonce came to my house and I had to make her breakfast. Are you high? I would be losing my mind. Like, forget it. Just forget it. And I enjoy so much that the show takes the time. It makes me feel like they're really seeing all of these women as people and not just background noise. And that's so unusual and important and unexpected. Um, Patrick says, didn't you love this exchange? She somersaulted an et and said her entire fucking dietary outlook had changed. What plate did she eat from? She ate from them fucking both. Yes, I did. I really just love Jewel in general. I love when she's like, she's like bouncing off the walls in excitement in the scene, which is so cute to see. And I just love to see women supporting women. You know, I feel like it would be, uh, okay, I'm going to be honest. A lot of male writers would have written Alma as much bitchier than she is. And don't get me wrong, she's bitchy, but like, I think in a great way, I like her. And they would have made a lot of the women around her like really jealous and mean. And instead they're having her, them, her be admired. And I think that makes sense. Um, I just really loved this. So I just wanted to, t to touch on that because I, I could see plenty of people reviewing this episode and kind of treating that moment as like, that's weird, but it made a big impact to me. Um, okay. So let's talk about Jerry and Hearst again. I don't even know what to say because Hearst is standing here and he's talking to Jerry, but obviously wants this guy to be gone. And Jerry keeps, on. I am hypothesizing. Do you have some private hypothesis as to my possible role in the shooting of Mrs. Ellsworth in the rising of the sun? And he says, I would hypothesize as to the latter, possibly, sir, before imagining you involved with the first. Ah, oh, Jerry, I hate you so much. You're so pathetic. You really are. Um... And he essentially tries to be like, I know that you're a certain kind of dude and that you function by totally different rules. The whole usual, you're rich and powerful and therefore above the law. And he's trying to get rid of Jerry. And finally, Jerry is ending with, the troops in Sturgis await your instructions and he says, thank you very much, and shoves him out the door, essentially. Now, is Seth aware about all of the troops? Because if he's in Sturgis campaigning, I feel like he can't fail to see all of these dudes. And if he sees these dudes, he can't fail to know why they're there, right? Will he know? I feel like it's got to be... Like, he's got to know what's happening. And, and he gets summoned back, and he's so angry. And we all assume that he's so angry because of what happened to Alma. And I'm sure that's a huge part of it. But I think there may be part of that anger is him coming from knowing exactly what the fuck is going on. 
Um, so yeah. Anyway, we go from, um, from Jerry leaving to then that Pinkerton dude coming in to talk to Hearst, uh, Barrett and Hearst is sending Barrett over to speak to Al. And Barrett says something about how the last guy that you sent with a message for Al wound up dead, to which Hearst is basically like, and are you a pussy? Do you know I'm going to go? Is that what this is? And he's like, no, no, no. I really don't worry about that now. I'm just making an observation. And Hearst browbeats him into reading aloud what the message says. Which is a bunch of like, oh, I'm so sorry about what happened. Uh, who knows who shot at her? What a terrible circumstance. Do you need any help with anything? Like, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And this leads to a pretty startling scene in which Barrett, well, all right, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I'll say I was startled. Before Barrett heads out, Alma goes on her walk by herself. <clears throat> and I have to say, what balls this woman has, I swear to God. What ovaries. Um, she is convinced enough by Al's argument. You're not, you're not supposed to be a victim you're supposed to be the bait to make everybody else overreact. And she gets a look on her face. It's like she realizes he's a hundred percent right. And she squares her shoulders and is like, all right, I'm going to fucking do it. And I'm like, girl, oh, yes. And she goes downstairs and Ellsworth's there and Ellsworth wants to go with her. And she has to be like, listen, I really appreciate you. I really do. But if you go out there, First of all, you're going to be playing right into his hands, which don't do that. We don't want this guy getting the upper hand. Please, please, please. Secondly, I had really hoped that you would come and have dinner with me and Sophia tonight. And you can't do that if you're dead. So maybe if you're cool with it, you could, you know, stay alive. That'd be great. Um, so he finally agrees she goes out and walks and Ellsworth goes out on the front porch and Al has to be like, don't take another step. And they stand there watching her walk her way past a couple of Pinkertons, but also past Charlie and Dan, who are set up in the street just to generally watch her. They're not going to step in. Silas is there also. I just love this scene. It is so tense and so it's just so tense, you guys. And I knew that nothing was going to happen. to her. I really didn't think they were going to come after her again. I really didn't. But you never know what Hearst is going to do because he's just that crazy so finally she makes it like breathing hard to the fucking bank. Bless her heart. I say it again. This bitch is made of steel. I love it. And then we have the scene where Barrett goes and talks to Al. He's trying because Al sort of pushes it to see whether or not there's any sort of like uh, schism, I guess, is the word I want, between Barrett and Hearst. He wants to know, is Hearst really, really loyal or is he just bought and paid for loyal? And he pushes it a little bit. First of all, we see Barrett getting like humiliated by Hearst in the previous scene when Hearst pushes him to read when he doesn't want to. But then he tells 
Al, basically, I didn't like what happened to Joe Turner. And that's Captain Turner, who Dan fought. And he says, I didn't like it because Al basically told him, even if you get the upper hand, I want you to draw it out and make him suffer. So even if you can beat him, don't do it too soon. And because he made that choice and, and told Joe to do that and was kind of selfish, Joe wound up dead. And Joe was somebody that, he, that Barrett had fought with. So Barrett doesn't like that and thinks it's disrespectful. So that's enough, I guess, for Al to be like, okay. And he gets up as if they're finishing their meeting. And Barrett makes the mistake of thinking that they're okay now. And says something about how Al doesn't scare him. It seems to me like you're not even halfway such a bad person. The whole thing. Well. He soon, soon learns differently. When he turns to get up and go out the door... And Al knees him right in the balls and then kicks the shit out of him. And Al reminds him of how you shot at a fucking woman, how you scared a bunch of people, especially Wu, in the streets with your horses, how you went and beat the shit out of Merrick, who hadn't done anything to anybody. And as he's kicking him, he says, how many ribs you think you broke? And this idiot says, I think at least two. And Al's like, I'm talking about Merrick's ribs. You piece of shit, basically. Which was one of the best moments ever. I loved that moment. That specific moment of I'm talking about Merrick's ribs. Like... This is the first time, and maybe it might be the only time, that Al really shows his hand that he gives a shit. And this scene goes on. Like, I expected him to beat the hell out of Barrett and then continue on from there and then basically kick Barrett out. But instead, he keeps Barrett on the floor, questioning him about what the fuck Hurst's plan is, and bashes him in the balls again. I think he, like, breaks a leg. Um, the whole thing is happening, meanwhile, while Hurst is standing on the opposite building, uh, quote, balcony, makeshift balcony, and has no idea what's going on. And Al at one point comes outside and Hearst looks a little suspicious, but all Al says is that he came out because he had to fart and he goes back in, continues beating on this guy. And the dude had said, I'm not going to tell you anything, but once Al presses the matter, he fucking starts talking for sure and says he sent for more guns. He wired for more Pinkertons. He, they're on the way. And I told you that. Uh, if he finds out, I told you. And Al says, don't worry. And he says, you won't tell him. And Al gives him a look like, you really don't know what's happening here, do you? And the dude literally starts crying. And finally, this this scene, guys, I can't really like emphasize enough how much I didn't expect Al to do what he did because I didn't think that he'd be able to hide it. But he's got 25 more guns coming, 25 Pinkertons. When they get here, he's going to move on the camp. Uh, before the elections, 25 Pinkertons already. He had 25 on the way and 100 at his operation before or after the elections. I don't know. I don't know. Please don't hurt me. I, it's all I fucking know. 
And Al, he gets a pistol ready. And so, of course, here I'm thinking he's going to shoot this guy. But then I'm like, well, no, he's not going to do that. And then it looks like he's handing it to him. And I'm like, all this, this whole scene, I'm like guessing and then re-guessing everything. Like, I, I have no idea. And I keep changing my idea of what he's going to do. And I'm not even sure at this point that Al knew what he was going to do. But he calls down Dan and Johnny and then I'm like, oh my God, he really is. And upstairs, he says to him, you're a cunt for hire to shoot at women and the like. Just trying to frighten you a little, encouraging you to chat. Who amongst us hasn't wanted to shoot at women once or twice, huh? And then anything you want to say else before I let you rest, knowing I don't sit upon you in judgment, And the guy starts crying again, and Al pulls his head back and cuts his throat. And I, sitting by myself in my living room yesterday, just went, oh, shit. Because I never expected him to do it. And fucking Johnny, they're rolling up the carpet. And Johnny's like, well, this carpet lasted longer than any of the other ones. Which, you know what, I'm, he's probably right. You know, like, why even get a carpet at that point? Um, but yeah, Al goes out there and talks to Hearst and tells him, well, you know, he said he was lighting out for Bismarck, but I thought he was full of shit. I didn't think he was actually going to do it. But since he hasn't come back to you and I haven't seen him, he must have gone out the back way and decided to do that. And Hearst is looking at him like he does not know what to make of this. Like he, Al is saying, did you have some kind of misunderstanding with him, sir, that he took for pretext of the letters delivery to make his fucking escape? Well, then I say, Mr. Hearst, that you are well the fuck rid of that cocksucker. And Hearst, meanwhile, looks like, Al is speaking a totally different language and is backing up towards the door in or the hole in the wall. And I would like to point out also that Hearst has still not made this hole in the wall into a proper door. And I feel like that's a real, like this little detail kind of indicates his character. He'll bash his way through and that's all. And he doesn't care if it looks nice. And he doesn't care if it's like, you know, civilized. He doesn't care if this is made to be functional. He can get through that and that's all he wanted. And there he is. And it's done. As far as he's concerned. That's fine. And it's just such a weird, yeah. So that's how Al leaves it. How's your back, Mr. Hurst? How's the fucking back there, pal? Oh my God. So good. So good. I loved it so much. Um, and really quickly, because I'm out of time, I want to touch on the fact that uh, there the reason this is called a constant throb is because Stapleton's still trying to fuck Claudia. She tells him to come back later. And then there's this whole thing with Joni and Jane. And I loved it because what it is, is Jane telling Joni about this bad dream that she had. And it's not a dream. It's basically her being like, I constantly let you and Charlie down. And yet you both keep still being there for me and helping me to be better, even though I'm not there for you guys. Why do you bother? Is kind of the vibe. And Joni kisses her. And it's so sweet. And I'm so happy that the two of them seem to be like really being a couple. And I want this forever. And I love it. I love that. And Jane, that, that feeling of just being constantly disappointed in yourself and shocked that other people are willing to still be your friend 
after that. That's a real thing. You're not the only one, girl. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm really excited to see what happens next episode. Thank you to Patrick for the commission. Sorry about my voice again. And I will see you all soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.